then I am strong. The name of this sermon is called, this is the first time I heard of it. Now, it could also be called Paul's bombshell, because he had not revealed to this. He had been in the church of Corinth, he'd started the church, he'd spent months and months there, and never said anything about this. Never brought it up at all. This was Paul's best testimony. This would be what you would lead with. Oh, let me tell you my testimony. I was taken up into the third heaven. I saw things and I heard things that were inexpressible. And let me explain that to you. No, he didn't do any of that. He didn't use it at all. He didn't mention it at all. He just kept it a secret for 14 years. Now, I, I suspect you remember where you were when Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon. I, I, was, I was in the hallway of the school in grade seven or eight. I was, re, it was a black and white TV, and it was this big, and I was 15 back, 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 and I could just see it. And he said those famous words, a small step for man, uh, giant step for mankind, or something to that effect. But suppose what had happened is the other guy, whose name you don't remember, was the first one down. But he made an agreement with everyone that I'm going to be first on the moon, but no one will ever know. Suppose that happened. And everybody kept it a secret. The command center, the three men on the, on the trip there, the one that stayed up in the the command module, the two that went on the moon, and Neil Armstrong really wasn't the guy. Suppose that had happened. How would you keep that? Why would you want to keep that a secret? I don't buy lottery tickets because according to the statistics, you would be more likely to be hit five times by lightning than you would be to win the big prize. But suppose you did win the big prize and you said, I'm going to take that ticket and put it right there and I'm not going to tell anybody about it. I'm not going to go collect on it. Well, all of that was like what happened to Paul, except more. I mean, he, he's, he got to go to the third heaven. He got to see heaven. Amazing. Now, and he kept it a secret for those 14 years. And he also got a thorn in the flesh that reminded him that greatness belongs only to God and not to God's servants. Um, something that is common among very important, very high-powered men is sometimes they do things that are ungodly. It was, it was revealed that Dr. Martin Luther King, the, the guy that started the... the freedom in the U.S., the, uh, the marches and the getting on the buses and doing all this thing, it was revealed that by the, the FBI were recording his conversations and he, he did all sorts of things that were wrong sexually and you think, well, maybe he should have had a thorn in the flesh to keep, to keep reminding him that it wasn't about him. That it wasn't about... And, and the, the sad thing is that this is all too common. People think, oh, there's a, there's a man in the U.S. who's uh, an evangelical pastor, a preacher on the radio or the TV, and he wants a fourth jet. Now, why does he need a fourth jet? He doesn't, right? It's, it, he, he maybe needs a thorn in the flesh. Maybe we should pray for a thorn. Anyway. I digress. Anyway, you see, God likes weak people. He can use them. He can do things that have no business succeeding through weak people. And because he approves of humility, he likes people to give him the credit. Because you've heard that verse, it's our reasonable service. Well, to give God the credit is our reasonable service. Well, let me tell you a story about a weak man. 
In the 40s, there was this man. His name is Bill Griffith. He lives in New Fork. Well, he lived. He's probably dead now, long ago. But he went to high school. He was a very smart man. He went off to university. He was going to be an engineer. And then he had arthritis. And the arthritis became really severe. And it, it eventually came to the point, because of the arthritis, that he could not move at all. He was confined to his bed, he lost his eyesight, and he could move this finger. That's entirely all he could do. He could talk, he could think. And so he, three years he spent in bed, and a doctor came to him and said, Look, you should be a happy man, you should be grateful. You get to think. And he says, yeah, I've thought about three years, the last three years of how horrible my life is. And he says, no, you get to think. Your mind is clear. Think about other people. And at the same time, as this was, he was being, being given the pep talk by the doctor, suck it up, princess, talk, his niece came to him and the family was busy, and she sat by his bed, and she, re she bared her soul, and he helped her. And because she did this, and because she was so helped, she brought her friends, and they were helped by him. And all of a sudden, he had a task. And then there was so many children coming to his house that the community said, this is this is, uh, the, let's build a separate entrance for him, for these children. The school was only a block away. They could come, they could go up to his room, they didn't have to walk through the house, they didn't have to be embarrassed, they could just see him. And so that's what they did. And so, they also, this is in the 40s, remember, when telephones were not that, it wasn't like these. And somebody hooked up a phone so he could, with one finger, the only finger he could use, he could call anybody he wanted to. And the, the pastor of the church in Norfolk said that he has helped more people from his bed than I've helped from my pulpit. The people that were, worked for the government that looked after young people who got in trouble said, he has helped more people than any ten of us. And the reason he could help people is they, he was non-threatening. He just laid in his bed, he couldn't even see them. It would be like talking to somebody on the phone, except they, he would just... And so he was very gentle, he was very kind, and he prayed all the time about these things. God gave him a sound mind. And not only with that, he had a really good memory. So when anybody came up with a problem in, in the city, they said, well, what are we going to do with this? Well, call Bill. We, we, they, we need a nurse. Well, we don't have any more nurses. Well, call Bill. Well, Bill would remember that Martha the nurse had a child and she stopped being a nurse, but she still has all the training. And I'll call Martha. And no one refused him because there wasn't a family that wasn't touched by his kindness. And so he was able to have 15 to 20 teens come to his house every day to get counseling, to be talked to, to be loved. To be able to explain to him how hard these things are as a young person to experience, and should I date this guy, and what if I, I'm pregnant, and what am I going to do? And, and he fixed all those things. And it wasn't really him fixing him, it was him allowing God to work through him. You see, his weapon was prayer, and he was never alone, and he always had God with him. Now, Here's the thing that um, God is the giver of fair exchanges. Sometimes they don't seem fair when we get them. How is this fair? 
How is this fair? For Bill, all he had to give up to help seven or 8,000 children, teens, a year, was all his mobility and his, his sight. That's all he had to give up. Sounds like a lot, doesn't it? But he did. And so that's what he had to give up. And God used him so that he was able to help people who were able to help other people once they were helped. No. Paul was given something that showed him the unmatchedless greatness of God. He got to go to the third heaven. He got to hear unspeakable words that no one could utter. The words it says here that... Um, This was incredible, the unsurpassing greatness of the revelations. He got to see those, but also, at the same time, he was given a thorn in the flesh. You see, Paul got to lean on the strength of Jesus instead of his own. Sometimes, like I was telling you about Martin Luther King, all of that went to his head. And he was, he could have anything he wanted, and he, what he wanted was not godly. Paul had the thorn in the flesh, and he understood that if I'm going to do anything at all, I must rely on Jesus. I watched a video a couple of years ago, and it was about a group that would take children on mission tours to Africa. Now they didn't help the people in Africa in any great way, but they helped themselves. And the video shows that there's a, a young man, he would be 14, 16, maybe 17, and he's going to the river. It's a five mile walk to the river. The women do this every day. And they have a bucket, five gallons of water. If you've ever carried five gallons of water, you want to do it for a short distance, not five miles. And they had a piece of cloth that you put over your head, and it went around and wrapped under that, and you carried that by the force of you keeping your neck five miles. So the first mile, he suffered. The second mile, he cried. The third mile, they had to tell him, look, these women do this every day. They do it every day, and you can't go five miles once. And so by the time he got there, he was almost, the last, the last step would be all he could do. But he learned something. He learned that not everyone's life is uh, wonderful. And they said that if the, if the girls get it, we know if the girls get it, by, because when we take them to London on the way back to the United States, on the return trip, they make two phone calls. The first phone call, they dump their loser boyfriend, and they call their parents and they thank them. And they tell them that they appreciate how much they've done for them and how much they love them. What this shows you is that, wait a minute, God is, I have to re recognize that God has given me many good things. Well, I'm going to, we started in chapter 12, where it says, boasting is necessary, though it's not profitable, but I'm going to go on to visions. That's not where it started. It started two chapters earlier. What was happening was Paul had started the church in Corinth. He'd gone there, he started the church. They were wonderfully successful. They were an apple that someone else wanted to pick. And, that, and he wasn't there. And they come thinking, I'll take over that really nice church for my own benefit. And so he's now away, and he's writing a second letter to the Corinthians to say, wait a minute, you've heard all this information, and these people are saying how great they are, how wonderful they are. And so now I'll have to explain to you that that's the wrong way. So let's look at 
this passage. Number one, I know a man. Now, just before we look at that, here's what he said. For I consider myself not in the least inferior to those eminent apostles. He was, his, his name was being dragged through the mud. And he was saying, wait a minute, that's not who I am. You know. Then he goes on to say in verse 22 of 11, um, 23, Are they servants of Christ? I speak as if I'm insane. I more so. In far more labors, in more imprisonments, beaten more times, times without number, even in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. And he goes on. He's boasting. He's boasting about what has happened to him. And he moves on in verse 1. Visions and revelations. Now, it was very important. God gave these things to the apostles. Peter healed the, the lame man. Peter did all these things. They were signs and wonders that proved that they were God's servants and what they were saying was true. And Paul was saying, I had all those. And here's what, I else, what else I had. This experience so foreign that it's improper for me to take credit for it. I really don't want to boast about it. Now, he, he was given this unspeakable gift. But he goes on to, you know, we, all of us, receive wonderful things from God. We get salvation. We get forgiveness. We get chances of, after chances of we fail Jesus we get safety. And none of that is for us to brag about. We can't brag about salvation. Well, I'm saved. Look at me, I'm saved. I did this myself. No. None of that stuff we get to brag about. Well, number two is inexpressible words. In verse four, he said, I was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. I, I found that really funny. If you read the Revelation of John, you hear about the streets are made of gold. You hear about the, the gates into the city were one big pearl. You hear about the, the walls are made of 12 layers of precious stones, different layers. You hear about the, the river of life flowing from the throne. You hear about the, the tree of life that has fruit, new fruit every month for every, all year. Well, how come Paul doesn't mention any of this? He got to see all of that, right? The only thing he mentions, the only thing he says is, I got to hear inexpressible words which are not, a man is not permitted to speak. Well, Paul, as I said before, was, is considered to be one of the, the smartest men ever to live. Aristotle, those people. He's considered to be in that group. And God gave him the thing that would appeal to him most, words. That was the thing he got. Number three is on him I will boast. Verse five and six. On behalf of such a man I will boast, but on my own weakness, on my own behalf I will not boast, except in regard to my weakness. <laughs> for if I do wish to boast, I will not be foolish, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from this, so that no one will credit me with more than he sees in me and hears from me. But he goes back again to that whole point. He says this over and over again through 
chapter 10, 11, and into 12. Boasting is un, a, not a good thing to do. It's not what God wants me to do, but you have forced me to do it. You have forced me to say these things so that I can reestablish my my disciples, my off, my my right to be the one that started and keeps this church. Now he went on to say that I I wouldn't I didn't bring this up. For 14 years I didn't bring this up. I kept it hidden. Because I wanted you to see only I wanted you to have only what you see in me and only what you hear in me. I didn't want you to say, oh, that guy, he's the guy that went to heaven. No, they wanted him, his, him only to be the person who brought the message. I'm bringing you Jesus. I'm not bringing you Paul, the guy that went to heaven. I'm bringing you Jesus. There's a, there was a man that came here to the Wesleyan Church. He wrote a book. He was a pastor who was at a conference and he was driving home and he was going across a bridge and the truck that was meeting him on the bridge pulled over into his leg and he had driving a small car it destroyed his car and he was pronounced dead on the scene they didn't do anything to him they didn't look after him because he's dead 45 minutes he was dead and then God brought him back to life. And so he was, he was having his testimony at the Wesleyan Church. He travels all around doing this. And he, the point is that Paul could have very well done this. This is my calling card. I went to heaven. But he didn't. That's not what he wanted to do. He wanted them to only see Jesus. And he wanted to be the vessel that brought it not the person that they looked at. So, in order to help him with this, in order to make sure, in verse number four is the thorn in the flesh. Verse seven says, because of the unsurpassed, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me to keep me from exalting myself. I, surpassing greatness. Inexpressible words. Those are about as high as you can get in a descriptive way about something that's happened to you. It wouldn't be like, I went to um, breakfast at the restaurant and I had a good breakfast. No. That's not the kind of thing he was saying. He was saying, I'm sur surpassing greatness of this revelation. <coughs> Inexpressible words. Things that he could not put into words that were so amazing. And as far as we know, he was the only human being that got to take these words and hold them in his head and carry them around for his life. He was the one that God trusted with these words. And you know what happens? I look out swelled head. And he didn't get that because he had a thorn in the flesh. There was one of the things that I thought was um, most people don't live a life where they have sayings that you repeat. A thorn in the flesh is a, uh, uh, one of those words that have become, sayings that have become so popular that we still say it today. I have people I work with who are thorns in the flesh. <laughs> I, I suspect I've been that a few times myself. The point is, because of what he said, because of what he, he experienced. In verse 8 and 9, he said, Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. He has said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in weakness. Paul, of course, said, I don't want this. This isn't what I want. This is what it isn't what I signed up for. 
Is this really necessary? Come on now. And God says, as a matter of fact, it is necessary, and I've got you covered. My grace is sufficient for you to go through what you need to go through for me. I provided all you need. Number five is, I can see because you are God. In the last part of verse 9, it says, Most grateful, most gladly, therefore, I will boast, rather boast about my weakness, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weakness, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. He recognized that not only did he have the thorn in the flesh, he had that other list back here that we read. I have been beaten, tithed without number. Five times I received from the Jews, 39 lashes. Three times I've been beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. All those things, he says, I willingly accept for the unsurpassing greatness of God's grace. For when I am weak, then I am strong. He recognized that the God uses humble people. God uses people that have experienced these things and recognize that God is in control. Will you remember that song, I haven't, didn't promise you a rose garden? Well, God didn't promise us a rose garden. He promised that if we cooperate with him, he will provide what we need even if it's an infirmity. Now we've experienced in Canada 70 years of peace, prosperity, and we have certain expectations. We expect to find a, someone to love, to get married, to have children, to enjoy vacations and, and, and live till we're old and have enough money to, to keep us reasonably comfortable in our retirement years. But we know from experience that this isn't true for everyone. We don't get all those things. But if you remember the story I told, Bill never got any of those. He got laying on his back, moving one finger. That's what he got. And neither did Paul. If you remember, Paul said, um, I don't have a wife. Peter and the other apostles have a wife, but I don't have one. And he recognized that this was God's will, and he was okay with that, because he could do these things without worrying about, well, I have responsibilities more than just God. Now, this all had started because the Corinthian church, somebody had come. And they wanted to diminish Paul's influence so they could take over. They didn't want him to be, to have it for himself. Well, Paul didn't want the Corinthian church for himself. He wanted it for Jesus. He wanted it to be Jesus' church. Every other church that he started, they were Jesus' church. But you know that saying, when the cat's away, the mice will play? Well, people recognized that these people were kind. They gave, they, they gave away their money. And that's a very tempting thing for someone who wants to become rich. That's a very tempting thing for a, a man who wants his fourth plane. Well, I know you good Christians will send money. I want a fourth plane. That's what these people were doing. And he said the church is too important to let that go. I'm not going to let that go. And so he ended up boasting. And boasting, he, he said, this is not the right thing to do. And he apologized repeatedly for boasting. But he said, I have to. Because the church is too important for it to pass on to be something other than God's church. So here's what we can learn about boasting. In chapter 10, Verse 17 and 18, it says, But he who boasts is to boast in the Lord. For it is not he who commends himself that is approved, but it's 
He who the Lord commands. So you need to learn, recognize that we boast in the Lord. And we learn strength and weakness, as in verse 9 we read. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. More gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weakness, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. And in verse 11 and 12, we get to recognize his servants. He said, I have been foolish. I have become foolish. But you yourselves compelled me. You see, what he was saying is, you should have said, look, to those people that came. Paul showed all these things of a true apostle. You can't be saying that stuff about him. But he said, actually, I should have been commended by you, for in no respect am I inferior to those other eminent apostles, even though I am a nobody. The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with all perseverance, by signs and wonders and miracles. He was saying, I had to boast, but I shouldn't have had to. I shouldn't have had to bring up all these things that would, would make me the proper leader of this church. You should have done that for me. We have to see that God gives amazing gifts, but he helps us to use them to build up the church and not build up our own reputation. Now, in closing, I want to remember, and us to all remember, that we belong to God. We are God's servants. And His church belongs to Him too. It's His church. And Paul knew that if he didn't fix this, with this extraordinary measures of boasting, that he would lose the Corinthian church. It wouldn't be Christ's church anymore. It would be whoever those men that came in to take it over. And lots of churches have become that. Well, there's some, there, and that's always the fear that we can become, if we're not careful, the church can become no longer Jesus' church. And that's what all these letters that Paul wrote to the churches, to Ephesians and Corinthians and Colossians, and John wrote seven letters in Revelations to the churches that said, look, these are the things I notice. These are the things you're getting right. These are your things you're getting wrong. Because we need, we have a gift. God has given us the church, our small part of it. And our gift is to pass it on to the next generation. And we don't want to let it go. In Isaiah 58, 6, I read this this morning. And this was the Israelites. He said, I will tell you what kind of fast I want. Free the people you have put in prison unfairly and undo their chains. Free those to whom you are unfair and stop their hard labor. Share your food with the hungry and bring the poor homeless people into your homes. When they see, when you see someone who has no clothes, give them yours and don't refuse to help your relatives. God is saying to the people of Israel, this is what I always planned for you to do. This is what I wanted for you to do so that people would recognize that the, the community of Israel, the special nation of Israel has something profound that no one else has. And it's something that you would want. And that's what we want in the church. We want to be able to say to people around us, we have the thing you want. We have Jesus. And we need to be able to say to them, come and see. We've kept it just the way Jesus wanted it to be. And we're going to pass it on to the next generation just the way he gave it to us. You see, when we pass it on, we want it to be a true picture of what the church is supposed to be. What God wants it to be, just as it, when it, he said in Isaiah, this is what I wanted it to be.